Well, good morning and welcome to The Garden Show. I'm Peggy Ballister Howells and this is Kusa Dogwood and we're here to answer your well, gardening questions. And garden so um, that's a, we have a technical difficulty in the background. Okay, that's fixed. All right. I am not in front of this beautiful yellow porch, but that is my Ocean Grove house. Tommy's doing magical things with pictures and backgrounds. So that's the Ocean Grove house. I've talked about it many times and um, it's a pretty good picture of the porch. So I have also been instructed to ask everyone to please hit the like and subscribe buttons below. I don't actually see the buttons, but apparently you guys do. And uh, that's supposed to help us. So we would greatly appreciate it. And if you could share the link with everybody that might be interested, that would also be appreciated. We are growing slowly, but um, we can use all the help we can get. So we appreciate that. And I um, have a couple of things I want to share with you. I did have my birthday this week and we we're supposed to go to the beach and it rained. And in the morning, Tommy was trying to surprise me and plant my jujube tree and he got rained out and we haven't had a chance to get back to it. So I'll, I'll probably do that tomorrow, get it in the ground and I will take pictures and I will show you next week. But the jujube tree is here and it's lovely. It really, you don't always know for sure what you're going to get when you order something in the mail, but I was very pleased. This looks like a real tree, small, but a tree and healthy and uh, in really good shape. It arrived in really good shape. So that's all good. All right. Well, we're going to do our, uh, regular thing that we're trying to do. And that is we're going to start with a tool. This is a tool. And this particular tool was inspired by Danny from Touchin, who she had when I was at her house. And she had one. I was like, that is a really cool tool. I need to have one. And one showed up under the Christmas tree that year. So this is a very cool tool. And you can see that it has a slight curve to it and uh, it has measurements on it. So if you're digging or planting bulbs, it's very, very useful. So it has a sharp edge and it has a serrated edge and the serrated edge is great for cutting roots and the sharp edge is just when you need a knife, you need a knife. So, um, and it comes in this leather pouch and see that part it, I can wear on my belt. I, I added the little string so that I could hang it on my potting bench on one of the hooks so that I always know where it is. If you always put things back where they go, then you know where to find them when you go back to look for them. I'm not 100% good with that, but I try. So um, I do wear it on my belt. And I have gone into stores wearing it on my belt. And uh, people comment pretty much all the time that I kind of look like crocodile Dundee, but, uh, but it's still, when you need it, you want to have it on you and it has multiple, uh, applications when you're working in the garden, you can scoop. One of my favorite things to do with it is to use it to shove down the side of pots when I have a big plant that I need to transplant and it won't come out of the pot. So it's very handy for that, but I have a, a few others. So let's go to the, well, we can't call it, the, the slides. It, we can't call it videotape. It's not a videotape. I can't like do that thing. Go to videotape. No, we're not going to go to the slides. Okay. So they're called Hori Horis. It's a Japanese tool and they are um, wonderful tools and I really love them. And they're, they're, very sturdy and they come from different manufacturers. Now, um, this one is from a company called bare bones and they have two different kinds. The one on the left is considered a, uh, a hunting hori hori. And the one on the right is their typical garden one. And you can see the prices. Um, it just so happened that I was, at a store yesterday. Yes. Was it yesterday? Yesterday? No, day before. Um, and they were having them on sale. So I picked one up. Uh, I don't know if my brother's watching, but it's going to be one of his Christmas presents. I'm very excited about that. Uh, but that's just one manufacturer. And this was really a high end manufacturer. And the thing about the tool is that uh, the case on this one is not leather, but it has 
both a place to slide your belt on the back and then it also has a clip so if you're not wearing a belt you can clip it on your pocket which which i think is very handy but i i would say the tools are comparable but there are other manufacturers as well this one i thought was really interesting this is from a company called wix forge and it's all one piece and it's wrapped the handle is wrapped and it's a nice bright color which is very helpful in the garden under any circumstances to have a nice bright colored handle so you can find it in the grass always but the thing that i liked about this it doesn't have measurements on it and it's a little more scoopy but it is a solid piece there's no wood on it and if you're trying to get it in the ground and you're trying to dig something out it is designed so you can hit it with a hammer and i thought that was kind of a a cool modification so um, i don't have one of these it again it's produced by a company called wix forge and yes it's a little pricey but it's a cool tool so uh, but we have a couple others to show you uh, this is again a slight modification and basically it's the same idea but if you can see the blade is offset from the handle and that has a couple of benefits one of the benefits is that your hand is protected when you're digging in. But the other thing is that it gives you a, a leverage, a, an added benefit of leverage when you're trying to dig something out. And when you're having trouble digging something out, you need all the help you can get. So that's a good, a, a good modification. And you can pick which one of these you like the best. Um, this is a company called Garrett Wade. And they make excellent tools. This one, I think, is pretty comparable to mine in that it has the leather case and it has the rounded blade and the wooden handle. It looks very similar. This one's $67 or in that ballpark when you try to get it online. So um, I like this one and it looks, again, like good quality. But this is the one that I have. I'm not sure if Tommy actually got it at Amazon, but it is available on Amazon. And this is mine. And you can see um, that mine has the same Japanese writing on the back as that and in the same case. Um, and it did come with a little sharpener. And I use that sharpener. I keep that sharpener on my potting bench. And so I use it. But of course, as you know, as I said last week, I keep a Felco uh, sharpener in my back pocket whenever I'm working. And I use that quite a bit. So um, these are all tools that I really am fond of. I don't know which of these would be better, but I have this one and I absolutely love it. So I'm going to give the phone number right now um, because we do have four open lines. And the number here is 1-888-399. 7344. Peggy, P E G I 7344. So we're going to, uh, can we get done with the Hori Horse? There we go. And now we're back to me. Again, the number 888 399 7344. Kuz has been hanging in here for a while, which I think is, um, I don't know if he's going to stay here too much longer, but he's here. All right. So since we don't have any callers, but again, let me give the number, and it's always on the lower part of the screen, 888-399-7344. All right, so I did, I'm going to put him down. Say, say goodbye to everybody, Kusa. Say bye-bye. Okay, I'm going to put him down. Because I did get a birthday present from Jordan that everybody needs. It's not a gardening tool, but it is a salad spinner. And let me say... If you're growing greens in the garden, you need to have a salad spinner. And I had one for years and I loved it. And I went to use it not that long ago. And I pulled it out of the pantry, which is where it was living. And somebody put it in there, actually. It wasn't even supposed to be in there. I have another spot for it. But I pulled it out and it looks like somebody stepped on it. Something heavy fell on it. It was cracked all the way through. The outside part was cracked. The inside part was cracked. Totally worthless. And I was really sad. So I said I needed a new one. And so Jordan, being the cook that she is, uh, said that she would find me one for my birthday. So she did. But see this? It's made from OXO, O-X-O. And it's a good size. It's big. But here's the thing. That's 
Okay, are you ready? No, don't get scared. Okay, don't get scared. Okay, so <laughs> it scared me the first time I did it. But when you press this down, it spins really easy. And the thing that's super cool about this one is while it's spinning, see the black button? That's a break. And it stops it instantly. I think that's cool. So that's it. That's everyone needs to have one. We'll be harvesting like fall leafy crops very soon. And so you want to have a good salad spinner. Again, that one's made by a company called OXO. O -X -O. All right, we're going to go to the calls. Um, it's Danny from Metuchen. Hey, Danny girl, how you doing? Hi. Uh, Hi, Heidi, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. I actually, um, I thought I just watched your show and you were introducing the tool that, um, that we, we got have, for yes. Christmas. Yes. Yes. And I actually just used it to pull out a hydrangea that I just bought last week. And because I was, I'm home by myself, I'm trying to get this planting done. And I was struggling with pulling this pretty good size hydrangea out of the pot. So I, then I thought, about, hmm, I have this very useful tool. So I went around wherever I can push it in and I was able to get it out. And that makes, um, it really is very, very useful. So, um, and I use it the same thing. And there've been a couple of times when my only other alternative was to cut the pot or break the pot. If it was plastic pot, cut the pot or a big clay pot. I hate to break clay pots, but sometimes, if, and this tool, this Hori Hori has been very, very helpful in um, making sure that that doesn't happen. So, um, and how's it going with your persimmon tree? Um, I actually went out and took a close look. The, the more leaves have fallen, and there is a small red hibiscus, the shrub type, um, lost all, all its leaves. So but in the same area? Was, yes. Yeah. However, there is a pretty good size um, lavender. It wasn't affected by it. So it is what it is. All right. So we don't know for sure that it was any kind of herbicide damage, but it, it seems like it's a possibility. Is that correct? Right. Okay. Yeah. So yes. there isn't much you can do about that. We've already had plenty of rain, so it would have washed away whatever residue was there at this point. It does hang around in the soil for a while, but not much you could do about that. A good mulch and maybe working in a little organic matter around the top might help a little bit, but I would suggest come spring, you give it a mm -hmm. dose of fertilizer, give them all, and they, they may come back. They may outgrow any damage that could have been enough to cause the leaves to fall off, but maybe not enough to kill the whole plant. So we can keep our fingers crossed and you'll just have to see next year. Um, and the only other possibility is, you know, th that makes any sense since two plants next to each other were affected in a similar way. It doesn't look likely that in either case it was a disease because diseases don't usually affect unrelated plants next to each other in the same way. Correct. So that, right. that kind of is evidence that it's not likely to be any kind of disease. So more likely that it is environmental of some kind or another, um, either a lack of water or just, you know, combination. That was a relatively newly planted um, tree. And so it didn't have a real well-established root system. So it could have been affected by the heat and the drought. And an inch of water a week is exactly, you know, what's generally recommended, but maybe that needed to be watered more deeply, um, maybe with a hose at the base. Just a suggestion. We don't really know. We're kind of shooting in the dark because it's got shriveled up curly leaves and, and, uh, and, both drought and pesticide could have affected both species in a similar way. Right. So it's it's one right. of those two things and only time will tell. And hopefully in the spring, oh, you might want to prune it too. Come spring, you might want to give yeah, them a Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you. So should I prune it now going into the fall? 
No, I, I or should I prune it in the spring? I would prune it in the early spring. See if you can see what's what's alive come spring. And then, of course, you remove okay. anything dead first and then shape it and take the pressure off the root system and, and keep your fingers crossed. Okay. Okay. So the main reason why I'm calling actually is to ask your advice for this newly purchased uh, hydrangea. I found what I wanted it. It's called Endless Summer Twist and Shout. It's uh, one of those lace cap type right. and it has color range from purple all the way to like rose color so i was very happy um the plant is pretty good size even though the tag says only grows to about three feet max i think right now this plant is about three feet wide and okay. about two feet tall so there are a lot of branches that it's really extended out and some of them actually has flowers on them well this is exciting so, did you yes. send me a picture you had to send me a picture uh, once it's in the ground, I will, okay. including my um, my the rest of my garden. So why I'm I'm trying to figure out what should I do to keep these reaching out arms. Uh, there are like three pretty long branches sticking out. I know that once you uh, plant a newly planted uh, shrub, it will be a good idea to prune it a little bit, so it give you know relieve a little bit of burden for the roots so uh, i'm gonna what um, would you suggest you pulled this out of a pot right yeah and you, you're not transplanting it and it wasn't no it wasn't b and b bald and burlapped so no. and and we're at the end of the hottest part of summer you know that's winding right. down i would say uh, that you're okay I, I don't think that you need to prune it okay I, I, if it were me, because you're not really disturbing the roots that much, and it was happy in the pot with that many roots, and now it's going to be in the ground, and the roots are going to be protected. And if it was a B and B plant that they had dug out of the, I would say you, that would make more sense to give it a pruning. Or if you were transplanting it, I would also, because you always, when you dig something out of the ground, you always leave some roots behind. Unfortunately, right? I mean, you know. You just do it's just the way it is so um under those circumstances i would say yes but under these circumstances i think you can get away with it i don't think you need to because uh you know all the roots are there and it was in really good shape um and it sounds gorgeous so i can't wait to see it uh, i would make sure that you water it really deeply when you water it and don't put mm -hmm. it in a place where it gets too much sun because hydrangeas will cook oh we're looking at my screen here and we're looking at my house in ocean grove and we're looking um on the right of the screen is a hydrangea that's a hydrangea and there used to be one on the left side as well on the other side of the steps and they were the same ones they were the same hydrangeas and the one on the other side of the steps i took out because it was not protected by the oak tree and it used to cook it used to turn into right what look like burnt waffles, the leaves, and we right. had to dig it out. Right. But the one on the right, even though they're facing the same direction, got shaded at midday from the oak tree that's um, between the sidewalk and the street. And it, it does fine. It doesn't get burned ever. So that really does make a difference. So you don't want to put it in too much sun. Bright light is much better. You don't want it to have intense midday sun. So as long as you don't put it in a real sunny location, should be good. I don't think you need to prune it. I wouldn't prune it. If I liked it and it, okay. and the roots were intact, I would just, you know, go with it. Okay. That's why I like I say I I pull it out and I put it in the hole that I dug and then I say, I'm going so I'm going to go call Peggy before I do anything. <laughs> Well, if, no, you don't have to. What I plan. No, uh, under these circumstances, okay. you can get away with it. Okay. All right. Great. Is there anything okay. else I can do for you today? No, we're good. You're so good? I I bought some um, old um, discounted bulbs, um, the hollyhocks, and I'm gonna just put it in and see what happens. If it comes up and comes up, if not, I will you know plant more in the spring. Well, so that's what I will be doing after the show. 
one of the things I need to do between now and next week, and I will try to make sure I have a slideshow is you want to order any bulbs that you want to plant in October need to be ordered now. And I know there's a couple of things oh, okay. I want to order. Uh, the main thing that I want to order is a, is a bunch of magic lily bulbs. And um, they're one of my favorites and I don't have any here and I keep forgetting to order them. I think that you can get them in the spring and then, in the spring i'm reminded you can only get them in the fall and then i keep forgetting so i really need to do that because they are one of my favorites and they bloom at a really good time which is in early august after a lot of other things that are blooming and they are magical plants because the foliage comes up in the spring and then it completely disappears and then the flowers come out in early august and they shoot up and you can actually see a difference if you go look at them in the morning and then come look at them at night so you have reminded me i will order those this week for sure and along with any other bulbs, your tulips, your daffodils, all that stuff needs to get ordered now. So you have it to plant um, in October. That's a, something, okay. something we would, all need I would to check, do. You know, yes, I will make a list. Okay. All right. That sounds good. All right. So is there anything Thank else you. I can do for you? No, we'll be in touch about visiting the plant place. In, in Edison. Edison. Okay. Well, that just reminds me again, because I have some slides. Um, I went down to see Mel at Madden's in uh, in the Princeton area. So I have some slides to show of that place. So, and then we'll do um, the Edison place next week and we'll have some pictures to share with, uh, with of that lovely, unique place. So the week of Labor Day, after Labor Day, we were thinking, right? Okay, yeah. we'll do that. Yeah. All right, very good. Thanks for okay. calling, Danny. All right, you have a great day. All right, thank you. You too. All right, bye-bye bye now. All right, can we go to those slides? All right, so... That is Madden's Family Farm, and it's located on Route 27 down, not quite into Princeton, but very close. I think their address is Princeton. I don't know if they're physically in Princeton, but they're very close. And it's such a great place. And, you know, I, um, I make a point of going, you know, whenever I'm in the area, I like to pop in because you never know what they're going to have. And this is the side. It's like a big giant barn. There's a lovely second floor. Um, one of the things that I really admire about Mel, who owns this place, is she takes really, really good care of her staff and makes sure they're, that they are comfortable and have what they need. And there's always, you know, there's a really nice area for them to cool down in and to eat in and upstairs. It's just, it's really nice and everybody there is so nice and you can tell that they feel appreciated because they're always so pleasant to work with but that's the side this inside uh where she has some of the coolest most interesting things and in the summer um when things are slow the staff works on making handmade christmas ornaments and she's just now starting to you know set up for for christmas you can see there's a little so i took these pictures yesterday so that christmas tree that silver christmas tree is the beginning of all of her christmas decorations but the inside of the you can wander around and you know she has odds and ends but lovely stuff this is one of the most active areas in the summer because that gazebo is where you go and pay and she sits in there with her cash register or one some other cashier will but she's always around to answer questions and uh, there's um mostly small shrubs in there but that's there's you know trees and other things as well and uh, and she does carry trees she carries all kinds of things and those happen to be crepe myrtles and they she had a nice selection of colors and that's the greenhouse and inside look at all those hanging pots she's got up there all kinds of interesting things and every time i go everything's rearranged and new stuff and she brings new stuff in all the time so look at at this next picture is um some of the wonderful house plants interesting house plants she has but my favorite thing that she has is an amazing collection of um, cactus and succulents they're just really fabulous and so tempting so tempting whenever i go there that i need to pick up another one and she also carries a really great selection of clay pots and big uh, ceramic pots and concrete planters. She has a little bit of everything, but it's always pleasant to go. And again, it's, um, you know, she's become a good friend, but I know her through, through business and we have become good friends because um, she's just 
awesome to work with always very knowledgeable very friendly always pleasant and it's just a nice place to visit and that's her that's mel madden and she has started this business herself when she was a mom with a toddler and pregnant <laughs> that was a while ago but she's done it all and um I like to support local businesses. I like to support good businesses and I like to support uh, women in business. So it's a win-win for everybody. So that's Mel. If you go and visit her at Madden Family Farm on Route 27, just tell her I said hi or that you saw it on the show. That'd be great. Okay. So do we have any more callers? Where are everybody today? All right. So the number here is 888-399-PEGGY. That's P-E-G-I or 399-7344. Would love to hear from you. And again, Tommy has asked me to remind everybody to please hit the like and subscribe buttons, which are somewhere on your screen and to share the link with anybody and everybody that you know that might be interested in, uh, in joining us on Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock. And oh, you can also watch the shows when they're archived. This is our fourth show and it will be um, available. They're available on the website. So, okay. So let's, um, let's do a few bugs. Okay. Let's do a few bugs. Uh, none of these are, uh, I have, um, while we're going to do a few bugs, I'm going to say that I have seen more lantern flies here at tiny farm this year than I have in the past, even though supposedly the overall count is down a little bit they seem to have found tiny farm but an interesting observation is that the lantern fly seems to prefer the color white not entirely sure why but they seem to gravitate on the side of the white garage and outside the back door on the right on the white wall and please try this and tell me if you think that it works but i have found you know how they tend to hop away i have found that if I use a white paper towel to try to catch them, it doesn't make them hop. And I have a pretty good success rate of getting them if I use a, a white paper towel and maybe they, they don't find that offensive or scary or whatever. But Okay, so this little critter is somebody that I found. I was pruning... I was pruning the hedge, the tricolor hedge, and this guy just appeared. And um, he was very big and he was a little bit scary. And he's called um, a grape weevil. And um, he's not really a problem. He, even though he's on grape vines, they really prefer being in the woods and they, they don't really affect uh, cultivated grapes very much um and they but they they come out mm, early summer so if you see them you don't necessarily have to kill them you know they're not really going to hurt anything they are kind of scary looking um big big but uh, but fun and that was the first one i had ever seen so that's one new bug that i had come across and this i think that this is a, a a damselfly. Uh, it's not a dragonfly. Its tail is too big. And this critter was in my greenhouse. And it landed on this plant. And it stayed there for like a couple of hours. And I went over to look at it. And it landed there and died. It was dead in that spot. And I thought that was extremely odd. Um, it wasn't, there was no spider webs. There wasn't anything on it. I didn't spray any chemicals or any pesticides. It just came in and died. But I thought that it was really very interesting. And it was very nice of it to pose for me to be photographed. And I have no idea what this is. It was, it's very, very tiny. And it was also posing. Look at it. It was posing. So I, I took its picture. It was outside. And I, I have yet to figure out what it is. It looks like some kind of fly-like creature, but I just had to share its picture because it, it was posing for me. So I, I had to do that. And this is a lace wing. And that actually showed up in my kitchen. And so we very carefully rescued it and let it go outside. Now lace wings 
are really very beneficial insects and they have very lacy wings, which, you know, hence the name, but they, they eat aphids. And so I put it in the greenhouse. Again, I don't spray any pesticides in the greenhouse per se. The only thing I use for pest control in the greenhouse is soapy water or maybe alcohol, um, which I use more on a Q-tip than spray. Some, sometimes I'll spray it, but then I'll take the plant outside. So I let it go in, in the greenhouse so it could be a helper, but it's such a pretty delicate thing. So it, that's it, it went, um, it landed on a snake plant and you can see it, it's really very, very small. It's not a gigantic creature, but you can see right through its wings. And it's real, I think it's a beautiful shade of green, very pretty kind of little thing, so. That one's scary. It's not, it doesn't really do anything very bad. It's called a click beetle. And those are eye spots. They're not really eyes. And they're just, uh, they're there to scare off predators. And they are a little bit scary, but they, they, they don't do a tremendous amount of damage. And that's it in, in kind of a more natural setting. And I think that's where we found it out in the grass, but they, uh, they, they don't do a lot. So, um, Again, I don't know where our, all our calls are today, but the number here is, is that the last, that's the last one, right? Okay, that's the last bug. The number here is 888-399-PEGI, P-E-G-I, which is 7344. And we would love to hear from you. We're gonna be here until 11 o'clock to answer your gardening questions. So if you, would like to give us a call. Yeah, let's do that one, the hardy kiwi. That would be good. So we're going to move on to another project. If you remember last year, oh, we have a caller. All right, well then uh, let's uh, let's hold off on the hardy kiwi and we will go to the phones. And it's Chris from Scotch Plains. Good morning, Chris. Oh, we have a caller. All right, well then uh, let's, uh, let's hold off on the hardy Hey, Chris. Chris, good morning. Good Hi. morning. How are you today? Good, thank you. Good. Uh, I'm calling about some uh, some uh, insect pests that I uh, have on uh, uh, brassica plants. Last week I called and I was talking about planting cabbages and uh, cabbage and broccoli and uh, and collards, and I did. But these are like the incredible uh, shrinking plants. Uh, I noticed some small cabbage loopers that were growing, and I also I noticed there were a lot of uh, white flies on the plants. Uh, some of these were in the vegetable garden, and then I had some seedlings on the deck, maybe about 200 feet away, and they were getting infested as well. So I just wanted to have some uh, idea of what I could uh, could do to uh, control the insects. So we're talking about white flies and cabbage loopers, mostly. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. the, the cabbage loopers. Couple things. Um, in both in both cases, both white flies and cabbage loopers, they are. That's one of the disadvantages of planting a fall crop because they have mm. multiple generations throughout the summer, so that the population is dramatically increased when you're trying to produce those crops in the fall as compared to the spring. Now, white fly does mm. not does not survive our winters, so there's almost none in the spring unless they survived in somebody's greenhouse. So if either in your own greenhouse, if you have one or inside, if you had plants inside where they had them, or if the greenhouse where you made your purchase had a, an overwintering population of white fly, but yes. outside they, they, there's none, they don't survive our winter. Even I don't think our mild winter that we had last year. So, um, so when they, they have to fly up, and from the south. So when they fly up though, they have multiple generations. So there's more now, a lot more. And the same with the cabbage moths. But the thing about the cabbage moths is that um, you can a little bit head them off at the pass by looking at the underside of the leaves because they lay their eggs there and you can squish mm -hmm. the egg masses. Are you familiar with that, Chris? I'm sure you are. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you gotta look, but that's- yeah, good. Uh, this kind of took me by surprise because there was so much 
damaged uh, damage with the leaves. They were stripped, and at first it looked like there was a rabbit that ate them. But then I looked uh, closer, and uh, some of them come to a big, uh, plump, juicy uh, cabbage with these uh, well, eating away. Yeah, they they're sneaky because they they become the color of whatever it is that they were eating. So then they blend in, and they they tend to lay and hide along the veins so that they're really- Yeah, I was gonna say, I noticed that they were on the underside of the leaves and they looked very much like the uh, the stems and the veins. So it was, it was hard to see unless you know what you were looking for. Right, exactly, yes. But luckily, you know, they're not, you can just pull them off. I, it may There may be some advantage to doing that wearing gloves or rubber gloves, but um, mm -hmm. yeah, you can pull them off. I, I've never noticed a particular problem with them in terms of any kind of skin irritation. Some larval stages, if you touch them, you can get like a little skin irritation. I've never noticed it with them. They're pretty smooth. They don't have bristles and it's mm -hmm. the bristly ones that tend to be more irritating. Um, so you can just pull them off. And if you had chickens, you could feed them to the chickens. They would love that. But no, don't have any <laughs> chickens yet. <laughs> Sounds like a good plan. It is a good plan. It definitely. Um, but you know, you can just throw them in a can um, so that they drown. You know, just a little alcohol and water, and just throw them in there. And, um, so you know, mm -hmm. so you can keep a can with you when you're pulling them off, so you have something to do with them. You don't want to throw them on the ground; they'll crawl back up. So yeah, you, know, you want to throw mm -hmm. them in something, or you could squish them, uh, which is kind of unpleasant. I don't really like to do that. Sometimes I do it, but it's not something I like to do. So it's just throw them in a can. But mm. yeah, you have to really check the veins. You have to look for the underside of the leaves for the um, egg masses. And those you can squish. And those are very recognizable. So you want to squish them and, and, and definitely check both upper and lower surfaces, especially along the veins to pull off the, the different stages of, of the larva. Um, as far as any kind of spray, um mm -hmm. really i don't like to spray my vegetables um very much at all um you can use um a bt for the larval stages because it it will probably mm -hmm. it will get them uh which is considered organic and does not affect humans so you could do that um i would just really use um a pretty fierce spray of water for the white fly at least wash them away they'll come back but at least you know you can wash them away to some degree and you could also just squirt some soapy water some yeah some soapy water on them like a very heavy concentration of soapy water and spray that on them and let it sit for a wee bit you know half an hour or so and then mm. come back and hose it all off and that might oh, help okay. that I might help as that. well uh, that's really my mm. go-to uh pesticide that's the first thing I do mm -hmm. before I try anything else is uh, a fierce spray of water and then soapy water. Um, be, uh, and it's, it's pretty effective, you know, it really does work and it just basically smothers them. And, you know, so it, it doesn't help hurt the environment and you have very clean plants. It's true. And, and, okay. and that is an advantage, maybe not so much on the outside plants, but when you have insect infestations on your house plants, they, they do get dusty. You know, they get dusty mm -hmm. and put squirting them with soapy water and then hosing it off. They, they get nice and clean. So that's a, a sort of a little side benefit there. But uh, I would do that before I do anything else. And yes, okay. you can resort to seven oh, as well. So, I mean, I don't want really to recommend that big time. But yes, it's say it's considered okay. acceptable I'll, I'll to spray. Try yes, do that. And let me know how it works, okay? Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate it and love your show. It's so uh, nice that you're back on. Thanks, Chris. You have a great day. Next weekend is a holiday, so you know that'll be fun. <laughs> Are you broadcasting next week? Of course, yes, about? always. Yes. Okay, well, good. Good. I'll, the only I'll days, <laughs> the only time I ever took off on a holiday was on Christmas, and that's because they wouldn't mm. let me. Now. <laughs> So, um, and I, I mean, I did it on, I did it on new year's many times. So, um, so I don't know. I don't know if I can convince my family if, if, to, if Christmas falls on a Sunday, we'll do it, but it's at least we don't have to drive any place in the snow. So we'll, we'll consider it, but that's the only time I've ever taken off, you know, just to take off. So we'll see, but I'll be here next okay. week. I promise. Um, um sounds like can, can i ask you one other quick question chris for you um, almost anything I, 
Okay, so here we go. So I tried uh, starting some columbine from seed uh, indoors and outdoors. It took a while for it to sprout, and it finally did. But at this point, I just have like very dense columbine uh, seedlings in a uh, in a uh, rectangular tray. I need to do something with them. I wanted to know what you recommend at this point that I. Uh, put them into individual pots, or do you think it would be reasonable to try to get them into the ground? They're, they're very tiny, they're very crowded, uh, kind of neglected, but you know they're viable, they're they're healthy. You're just not sure uh, what the best way of managing them would be, so I wouldn't lose them over the winter. Okay, if you have a lot of them, which it sounds like you do, I would take a, a mm -hmm. multifaceted approach. I would take a few. Okay and put them in pots and make sure, you know, nice clay pots and, and choose the best one. Maybe even put two or three in one pot because transplanting mm -hmm. is gonna be traumatic and you may end up losing them. Um, if they all survive, you can just, you know, call out two and, and keep the strongest one. Um, but I would definitely try to put some in individual pots. And then mm -hmm. if you have more, um, you might want to prepare a little spot outside and mm -hmm. and then take a trowel and a small trowel mm -hmm. and scoop up a few and transplant them to this new area. And again, eventually okay. you can cull out the ones that you don't want and see which ones are doing the best and, and leave them. Mm -hmm. But it's going to be a challenge for them, little tiny plants to be surviving outside. So if you Put a cluster of them in you've got a better shot at at least one of them surviving okay. so i i would try that you know put a few together in spots that you want them outside and then put just two or three per pot and a couple of individual pots so you have a couple different approaches and um, okay and and, and you, that way you maximize the potential for something to thrive that, that sounds like a plan. Uh, in general, do uh, young columbines transplant very well? I have an area in the vegetable garden where I could, you know, keep pretty good watch on and water them regularly. I'm concerned if I put them in among the landscape, they, uh, you know, might easily be neglected. But I could keep them in like a nursery area, not a permanent home. If, if they were good for transplanting, maybe I could leave them there for uh, you know, the summer and fall and see what uh, survives over the winter time and move them to a permanent location. Does that sound like it would be... Uh, yes, and remember, you don't want to put them in blazing sun. Now, that you know, you right. don't want them too, too shady either. So you might want to consider when you, when you are planting them outside to give them an umbrella. Mm -hmm. Give them a little bit, okay. just, you know, until they get used to being outside. And that'll protect them yeah. a little bit from excess wind and too much sun just you know just until they get used to acclimate until they acclimate to being outside so just give them a little extra protection okay. and uh, and then after yeah, I after they have a I have a lot of areas the vegetable garden is in full sun but a lot of the plants are tall so I could plant them like on the shady side of the tomatoes or the shady side of the peppers. So I, I could probably find like little microclimates uh, to tuck them away in. But I like the umbrella idea as well, though. That sounds good. Well, that would, that would work if you wanted to put them in a permanent location, you know, to give them a little protection. Mm -hmm. So you, so now you got three things, a permanent location with an umbrella, <laughs> a temporary location in a micro environment with a, in, near the tomatoes and the peppers, and then in pots. And one of them is going to work, okay. if not all of them. They might all work, and you're going to have more combines, and you're going to know what to do with. I and mean, that would be fun. That would be a, a great problem to have. God willing, you'll have the plant sale next or a plant <laughs> exchange next, next year. Maybe we can bring some of the survivors there. Then. That would be that would be <laughs> you, you, tremendous. That would be fun. We would cheer you on. That would be great. Given, absolutely. Thank you. Thanks as always. You've given me a lot of ideas. A lot of. A lot of work to do for this afternoon. Thank All right. You. Well, you have fun. Okay. All right. Thanks for calling, Chris. All right. Bye bye now. Bye. All right. So, who have we got next? Pat is um, from Edison. Good morning, Pat. Welcome to the Garden Show. Oh, hello, Peggy. It's nice to be speaking to you once again. Yes. Things are rolling and along. Happy belated birthday. Thank happy you. Happy belated birthday, by the Actually, way. Actually, it's not 100% belated. I mean, yes, it was Thursday, but my family party's today. So my, my daughter's coming and uh, some good friends are coming. And Tommy is once again planning um, 
my favorite easy meal steaks on the grill and tomatoes from the garden that's it maybe some watermelon yep. <laughs> nice easy peasy yep. you know <laughs> sounds great yes it sounds does really great <laughs> i have a question i have a rosemary plant and a basil plant both planted in my window box and i do bring the basil in for the winter but will the rosemary plant survive in a window box no. for the winter no no okay well i'll I tell did bring it in last year and it lasted a while but it didn't last long so i will well i i have um a really robust rosemary plant in a pot in my greenhouse and it lives there year round and every year i plant one out in the garden in the in the herb patch that i have you know it has to compete of course with the mint that wants to strangle everything but uh it never it i've done it three years in a row and it hasn't survived and last winter was really mild and it still didn't survive so i think technically it's supposed to be able to survive outside but i haven't gotten one to survive yet so that's why i yeah. keep one there's this one recipe in the greenhouse yeah. There's this one recipe that I make um, with a loin of pork where I use garlic and salt and rosemary and I rub it all over and before I put it in the oven and it's just, it's really easy and it just, it's sensational. The flavor blend together is just perfect and as easy as can be. So I want to always have rosemary in case I need to make that because you know it's easy and fun and delicious so I never argue with anything that's easy fun and delicious right so yeah no I I, I do basically the same thing and that's why I grow it and when I open my kitchen window I do smell that and the basil so that's always refreshing and I'm planning on having a pork loin this afternoon with the rosemary there the you go so a great minds think alike <laughs> clearly clearly that's right so that's, yes okay. so you have to have it All so right. try you know, tr and I've also tried to propagate it. It doesn't want to root. I have had no success. Mm -hmm. And I asked my good friend Mel from uh, uh, Madden's Nursery. They saw the pictures earlier if you were tuned in. Um, and she's, yeah. she agrees that they're tricky to try to propagate. So um, yeah. so that doesn't no, I work. will dig it out of the... I would dig it out of the window box and put it in a pot and keep it in the house. There you go. I have a hang hydrangea that I've had trouble with for the last several years. It, no blossoms last year or the year before. This year, I got two on the very bottom. It's about five foot wide and four foot high. And of course, it's hanging over the sidewalk now. I don't know why it's not blooming. And I'm just wondering if, can it be split? I mean, it is in, it gets no shade during the day. Is that part of the problem? But I mean, it's been in the ground for like 20 years. Oh, a, a hydrangea we're talking about? Yeah. Uh, and, yes. And did it used to bloom? Yes. I, I I just don't know. I mean, it looks gorgeous with all the leaves. It's just no flowers. And I spoke to you previously. I have not touched it as far as pruning it, taking out the dead stuff, nothing. I had just left it go. And it comes back. But on the very, very bottom, had two blossoms to that this year. And nothing else is in the works. Well, I'm going to tell you that that doesn't make any sense at all from a horticultural point of view. So have you fertilized it? Yes. And I fertilized it with stuff, um, an organic for flowers. So I thought that would help, but Should obviously not. Um, have you had a pH test done? No. That, that might be worth pursuing. They are very pH sensitive. So that might be worth looking at but if it's been in the ground for 20 years the idea of digging it out and dividing it and rejuvenating it might be worthwhile okay All right. it, and I will. I it did will get it did get flowers on the bottom i wonder if that's new yeah. shoots coming up from the bottom that are younger and and fresher maybe okay see where they're Possible, coming from yeah. Yeah, it's it's not, you know, there's nothing here that we can say exactly that's why this is not blooming because right. it's supposed to be blooming. It's supposed to be blooming and they will last for years. So it should be. But uh, if it's been in the same spot for 20 years, then, you know, maybe it's maybe it's too crowded. Maybe it needs to be divided. That's a that's a reasonable and approach. OK, then I will. I will try that, too. I would do that in the um, spring. I have. 
In the spring, okay. Yes. Spring survive. Um, the Diane Hibiscus. Uh, I loved yours when on your first show. I had planted one plant. There must be at least 15 stalks by now, and they are falling all over each other. Trying, I'm trying to prop these things up, but can they be divided, or what do you do with that? Are you sure that they're um, all coming from the same plant? Well, they're all coming from the same clump. I mean, I don't know. If because I'll tell you, um, plant. I'll tell you, they, they drop those seeds, those seed pods that they make, they drop them. Right. And um, I spent a significant amount of time in my blueberry bed this week. You know, the crabgrass pops up and other grasses and... Mm. Uh, and yeah. I was just, you know, tidying it up. And in there, I have three gigantic hibiscus plants. And they're supposed to do their job of flowering later in the summer when the blueberries are done. And they do a good job. Um, but they have gotten they have gotten enormous. And I actually cut some of the branches back that were overhanging some of the blueberry bushes because as much as I love the hibiscus, that bed, the main event is the blueberries. So to right. uh, not shade the blueberries, I cut some of the branches back. And underneath uh, the branches, there were so many seedlings, so many, so many seedlings oh. from the hibiscus. So they could have come, they could be growing from last year's seeds you know, cause they're already yeah. like uh, 18 inches tall. And you, I didn't really notice that they were separate plants until I started cutting the big branches back. And then I could see that they were popping up. So if that's the case, those are easy to divide. Those are easy right. to divide off. Okay. And you may, if the, the clump is really big, you may be able to dig it out in the early spring and, and split it. I don't think I would try to split it too much. Maybe just split it in half and then put it back right. in the ground. But you should be, if it's that big, you should be able to. But first, I would look to see if maybe there are separate plants that came up from seed. Because that would be super easy okay. to divide. Okay. I have one more. <laughs> I hope you have no other callers waiting. Is but there some, there's I'll one. Oh, mailed. there's there's a couple, but we'll we'll get to them. Okay. I bought mum plants, small, you know, six pack of mum plants. And they have, in the hope that if I plant them now, maybe they'll come back next year. But okay. they all have buds on it. And my feeling is I should probably cut the buds off so that they bloom later. Yes, that would that's true. Oh. They would bloom later, except, you know, it's already the end of August, Pat. I yeah. would say, you know, if you did that in July, that you but at this point it might be so late that it they may not bloom. They may not bloom. Um, and if you want them, the earlier you get them in the ground, which is now, um, the better the chances of them establishing a root system and coming back in the spring. But the truth is, if you really want them to be perennial, you should buy them in the spring. They sell them like in flats I'm, and they look I like know. Them. And I, a few years ago, I did that. Uh, I didn't buy a flat of them, but I bought a few. And yes, and they came back because it was early. I did not see them this year, but I had not also been out that much. So I missed it. So when I saw them last week, I said, okay, I will give it another shot and see what happens. But that's your that's your so, best bet because then they establish a good root system before, right? You know, before winter comes. But the earlier in the fall you get them in, the better your chances. If you wait and plant them when they're enormous and in full bloom, well, your chances are slim to none that they'll come back the following. Yeah, no, that that never that never happens. Yeah, I know I tried that a few times yeah, and I gave work. up on that yeah, nonsense. It Right. I have a few that, right. you know, that I planted early and come back. That's the other thing in the blueberry bed. There's like maybe half a dozen mum plants that are in there to give me a little fall color. I try to have a little bit of things in there, you know, to give us, because it's right in front of the house. So I want to make sure that I have something in there, uh, not to compete with the blueberries, but to, um, you know, to make sure there's something interesting all the time. And uh, the, the mums, right, exactly. they are coming back. They are coming back. And they were planted in, then they were all planted in the fall, but early. And they didn't all come back. They Believe me. You know, if I planted 15, maybe six came back. All right. Well, that's better than none. Better than none. So I will give you, this, I will plant, uh, I did plant two so far. So I'm going to plant the, I'm going to take the buds off and then look where it goes. Watch it. Okay, well, keep me posted and how that works, okay? 
Yes, I will. And I'm sorry, one more question. I can't take a picture of it because my camera is being very finicky. My daughter has a pine, uh, a holly tree that is near her front window and it has grown too big. And I think they trimmed it from the top last year. So of course that made it sprout up from the top and made it even taller. What is the best way to trim a holly tree? I mean, it's a perfect circle. It, do you go by what you say about everything else? Go down to a lower branch and cut it. Well, if what, what is what's the goal? Just to make it smaller? Yes, because now it's gotten too big. Okay, you want to prune it? Okay, here's what you do. Here's what I would do if it was me. I would prune it in early December. In early December? Yep. Yep. That's when okay. I would. Okay. It produces flowers and subsequently berries on new growth. So it's one of the plants that you can prune in the fall and not prevent it from blooming the following year. Okay. So that's a key thing. Oh. Okay. okay. So I would prune it in early December. I would prune it with a pair of hand pruners and, you know, take the, go all the way around top, bottom sides and take the branches that stick out the furthest and follow them into either uh, where they join another branch or the center. You want to be really careful. You don't want to leave major holes. So be very careful when right. you do this, but go all the way around, always starting with the branches that stick out the furthest and go in and cut them and put them in a bucket of water and use them for holiday decorations. Oh, that's, that's a great idea. Except that this is already up to the second story. So they, well, then, they you know, then you want to get, kind of you want to get a pole pruner. You can do that. Um, I'm, is there oh, yeah. somebody That's there that, that is strong enough to handle a pole pruner? Because they can. Oh, uh, yeah. So there you go. Get a pole pruner. They have a snip at the top and go ahead and go for it and, and prune it. And you can prune it significantly. You can take as much as a total of a third off the whole thing. And it'll okay. it'll be OK. Now, the way holly is produced commercially is they cut all the branches off like every third or fourth year. They cut all the branches off, bundle them up, and then it re-sprouts in the spring. And that, you know, keeps them much smaller for sure. But that's how it's done. So it can handle a significant pruning. Uh, for me, I would stick to a third so that it still looks like something when you're done. But again, take the longest branches and work your way into the center of the plant and, and make your cuts carefully. One time a gentleman called me and he, he had followed my instructions and he had taken a plant branch all the way into the center and it left a giant hole. Well, you can't do that. You have to, you know, you have yeah. to be follow the branch and, and figure out if that's going to leave a giant hole. And then maybe don't take it all the way in the center, take it at a joint. And and right. then, you know, you have to add an element of common sense in because you don't want to leave gaping holes. But here's the other thing. If you happen yeah. to leave a gaping hole in a holly, it'll fill in because they're very good at regenerating. <laughs> OK. OK. <laughs> all right. I think that does it. Thank you very much. All right. You have a great day. Thanks for calling. Appreciate all your help. My all pleasure. Right, bye -bye. All right. Bye-bye. Okay. We have two more callers, right? And because we do not have to end at exactly 11 o'clock, there's no news broadcast. There's no advertising that we have to accommodate. We will take care of our callers and we will answer everybody's question that is currently on hold. So who's next? Is it Bob from Piscataway or is it who? There, just ask. Oh, hi. Who am I talking to? Hello. Marianne. Is it Marianne. You How are you, Marianne? <laughs> what can good. I How are you? I'm great. I'm really good. What can I do for you today? Okay. I we have a bagworm infestation in our evergreen. I hate those things. And we did that. We did have a um, pest control company come out a few days ago <clears throat> and spray, <clears throat> but I want to know <clears throat> how to avoid it. Excuse me. <clears throat> how to avoid it next year? Should I have somebody come out in the early or late spring and just spray to prevent it? Okay. The most important thing you can do right now is go out and pull all the bags off. Okay. And seriously, because. Um, the pesticide that anybody just sprayed is probably not going to be that effective because they're in their bags. Right. And if they come out and lay eggs, then you're going to have a bigger problem next year. Um, 
there really isn't a great control for them once they're established. Um, preventively, um, you know, I'm going to say, Marianne, I'm not 100% sure if there's anything that you could do earlier in the season. So I'm going to hold that question. And if you tune in next week, I'll make sure I have a good answer for you. I will do some research and find out if there is something that you can do. But I do know absolutely the most important thing is to pull the bags off. And they don't come off easily. Okay. Um, if you, but you want to pull them off and you want to put them in a plastic bag and throw them away. You don't want to throw them on the ground and you don't want to put them in the compost pile. You want to put them in a plastic bag, put them in the, wrap it up and put them in the garbage. That's the only way to really get rid of them. Okay. All right, but I promise I will. And the uh, evergreens are, yeah. Okay, good. Cause I just want to, you know, spray around the, if I can spray around the area early in the season to prevent this from happening again. But I will do what you said for now. Yes, and I will find out if there's any preventive sprays for that. I don't want to make a recommendation I'm not 100% sure of, but uh, you have plenty of time, so I'll be able to find out. And if you tune in next week, I will give you a good, solid answer. Okay, I will. Thank you very much. All right, you have a great weekend, and we'll chat next week. Okay. Okay. Okay, you too. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Tommy, okay. can you make a note? Bagworms for me? Okay, we're good. All right, who else? Bob from Piscataway, my buddy. Hey, Bob, how you doing? I'm doing well, Peggy. How are you? Thank you for uh, seeing my phone call in. No, isn't this great? It's 11.01. I didn't have to cut anybody off. This is a big improvement. Yeah, this is a good thing. Yes, it yeah, is. I'm sweating looking at the clock, seeing no, if I'm no. going to get fit in. So, yeah. <laughs> no, absolutely not necessary. It's a good thing. You know, at some point, I'll, you know, Tommy will stop taking additional calls, but anybody that's on there, I'm never going to cut them off. I think this is big, big improvement. So what can I do for you today? Yeah, yeah. Um, two things. Um, when Chris called about the white flies, I have a lot of white fly experience. Unfortunately, so much so that this year I didn't bother growing any brassicas except for the one uh, broccoli that he gave me because I, they're just really difficult to try to battle every year. And yes, through the years, I've hit them with a very powerful water spray. That does help. But what I found helped the most is a, a mixture of neem oil and soapy water in a pump sprayer and you you know you give the plant a fair amount of the soaking mostly you have to hit the underside of the leaves because that's where they like to lay and lay their eggs and you have to do it every three days because they lay their eggs every three days so if you stay consistent at it for a week or two or so uh you can pretty much get that population under control uh to a good point um, I've made it a habit of every time I would cut collard leaves to cook them or, pro or freeze them, I'd rinse them off in a, in a pot of water outside and then come in, wash them and clean them and get them ready just to make sure, you know, inspect each leaf, look for uh, egg masses, what have you. And I have seen white flies in the winter. Uh, they put themselves in really deep in the crevices. As soon as, you know, I pick a leaf and they come out, they die because it's, you know, very cold out. But I have had them survive through a good part of the winter, I guess, because they're insulated inside the leaf. I don't, you know, inside the crevices of the leaf. Well, that's scary. But the every three yeah. day thing that they lay their eggs every three days is an explanation for why the population is so much greater in the fall than it is in the spring. Because if they're laying eggs, which hatch out into adults every three days, and how many eggs do they lay? Probably hundreds. Um, right. That is a huge population explosion. And uh, uh, thank goodness that they don't survive our winters or for the most part don't survive our winters because yeah, yeah, we yeah. would become just yeah, a white really cloud. Yes, they're unpleasant. And yeah, supposedly they, really are. they are drawn to the color yellow. Have you heard that? Yep. And have you tried yes, that? One year I, well, one year I planted a bunch of marigolds in my garden for other pest control. I didn't realize they were all yellow. <laughs> so that's <laughs> root the white flies into the garden oh, uh, but i have done i have bought large pieces of plastic and coated it with petroleum jelly and hung them up to attract them to those sheets and trap them that way unfortunately you get a lot of other bugs too and i'm not sure if some of those are beneficial or not uh so i kind of stopped doing that and i just went back to the powerful water spray and the um neem oil spray and that seemed to work. It took a little longer, of course, and more work, 
but that worked. Or I just gave up the fact that I'm not going to beat them. And I, when I pick things, I just made sure I rinsed them off real good so that I don't bring them in the house. Did you see that um, that really cool uh, salad spinner that I showed at the beginning of the show? Yes, that was very cool. Yes. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Yes, you might find that yeah. useful. Certainly good for all kinds of leafy things to rinse them off. And, you know, it doesn't have to be just the stuff you get out of the garden, although especially useful because, you know, they come with other things on them as well. Um, you know, they get dirt yeah. on them and that kind of thing. But, uh, yeah, that's um, you might find that useful. I, I love it. It's like and a toy for me. That's <laughs> a good salad spinner is worth its weight, that's yes. for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So. All right, anything um, else? Oh, yeah, go for it. Yeah, really. Yeah, real quickly, we were talking, Nancy and I, the other day, and it's like, um, we haven't seen any lantern flies yet at all. And then about three hours later, she saw one. That's all we've seen up here this year. We didn't see the uh, nymphs up here, very, very few. I mean, last year, there was hundreds of them dropping out of the sky. So I, I don't know if maybe some kind of spraying went on or if the drought or if the cold spell right when they were maybe hatching happened. I don't know what it is, but whatever it is, I'm really grateful because this year up where I live anyway, we've had none, very, very few. Well, you know, um, you know, we're, we're very close to the ocean and people say all the time at this time of year, last year, as well as this year, that they, they go to the beach the lantern flies go to the beach yeah. and then they get blown yeah. out to sea now that's about the best organic pest control i've ever heard of <laughs> i think that's pretty Absolutely. good um yes but uh i did i have really observed um there's more on my property than i've ever seen before and and it's not a lot it's not like we're inundated um i pulled into the driveway yesterday and i saw two on the garage um there was like one on the steps. They're, they're out there. They're not in droves. They're you're not swarming. And they're annoying. Uh, Juniper caught one and ate it, and then she spit it out. Yeah. So I don't think yeah, they taste. Do that. Yeah. I don't think they taste very good. Which I, I will no, not. I don't think so. No. So um, so she spit it out, but she did catch one, and um, but I was absolutely amazed that they do not jump when they see my hand coming towards them with a paper towel i think wow that's interesting it, it is interesting i have probably when i tried when i can reach them and i can use a paper towel i have like a 75 percent kill rate on the first try with a paper wow. towel yeah yeah it's really pretty good wow. um so i don't know it must be the white that they don't they don't associate that with a threat because they don't hop Maybe. So anyway, maybe, onto something. maybe anyway, at least it's, you know, it's worth a try. I would be curious if anybody else tries it and see if it works. Um, because it's definitely, you know, it's Jordan and I are out there. She helps me quite a bit outside and we were laughing that, you know, that it seems to really work. And then she goes off after one without a paper towel, just, you know, cause you want to get them when you see them and they hop away, but the paper towels seem to do it. I don't, at least wow. it's, worth, it's wow. worth an experiment, right. To give it a try. Absolutely. All right. Is there okay, anything else I can it. do for you, Bob? No, for now, that's about it. Thank you so much again for fitting me in. Well, you can uh, do something for me. What's that? You can give Nancy a hug and tell her I, I miss her. I want to see you guys. Can you do that? Okay. All right. Yeah, I'll let her know. Okay. Absolutely. Very good. All right. Thanks, thanks Bob. Lot, Have a great weekend. What's left of it? We'll talk soon. Yeah. Okay. You too now. Bye-bye. Right. Bye-bye. All right, so is that it? Are we we're done? There, we, so we got all the colors. So I started to talk about the um, about the kiwis. We'll just have to hold that off until next week because um, there are some fun things going on. And next weekend is a holiday, but yes, we will be here. We will be doing the show. Um, and remember to please hit the like and subscribe button below on your screen, and please share the link with uh, other gardeners and friends that you know. And also remember that my website, which you can go to the website, there's a link on the website to get to the YouTube, but also there's some interesting posts and blogs and you can write me, this is kind of interesting, and in the lower corner, right-hand corner of the screen, when you are on my website, 
you can click on this little green button. It's either um, a rectangle or a circle and you can click on it and it brings you to a way to contact me directly that does not, it's not a comment. It doesn't go on the screen. It's not for other people to see. And there's also a contact button that you can click. It says contact. Don't use that because that is not as good. Go to the little green square and you can click on that and you can send me emails that I will get directly. So until next week, uh, I will be here, same time, same place. My husband will be here. I'm sure there'll be some critter with me. So until then, have a good one.